and everybody. Um, our daily briefing on where we are um, and how the Im impact of the COVID crisis. I'm here with Josh Jabal, who's been helping lead our um, efforts here. And uh, Beth By, Office of Early Childhood, will be on in a few minutes. But first, let me uh, go over some of the um, current numbers. We have 874 people uh, tested positive. That's out of 2350 tests. Again, uh, the number who test positive is less relevant because that's impacted by the number of tests. You see our testing um, bounces around a little bit but continues to ramp up. I think uh, the numbers that are of particular interest to me, and I think the key metric, as I've said now for a while, is hospitalizations. We added uh, 87 more net people hospitalized, net meaning people going in versus those who are being discharged taking up to a total of 1,308 um, hospitalizations. Let me tell you why, what that means. That means, um, as I've said before, we thought the number of hospitalizations, that could have been the surge, that could have been the apex. That would, is what could have um, really put our um, hospitals under extraordinary stress. And that's why we instituted very strict social distancing measures early on um, a month ago. And uh, there are, it is paying some um, fruits of that. And uh, the fact is that 87 um, hospitalizations, we've averaged about 90 or so over the last five days. Uh, five days does not make a trend. My friend, uh, Dr. Jabal, he keeps reminding me, but five days is five days. And the week before that, there were about 102 hospitalizations. So at least we can say, we're seen to be flattening out. And what does that mean? That means it gives our hospitals uh, more capacity. It gives them more time to plan. It gives them more time to make sure that we have uh, ventilators and people in IC room, ICU um, rooms for you. It means that that peak may be somewhat mitigated, um, only thanks to your strict social distancing. I got to tell you enough, this is no time for happy days are here again. When FDR was singing that song, then we had a second uh, recession depression. We're not gonna let that happen here. We're gonna focus uh, like a laser beam on making sure as we move beyond this COVID crisis, we do it in a thoughtful, safe way. And that means starting with social distancing, you know, hey dude, keep your distance. I wanna hear that wherever I go, when I go to those state parks, uh, as we travel around the state. And we're gonna talk a little bit um, in a few minutes about our manufacturing facilities, safe manufacturing, safe workplaces. Yesterday, um, as you remember, we did safe stores. This next chart again tells you that, again, hot zones are uh, really reflected of where you are. And I don't have to dwell on this because it's similar to where we were before, but again, Fairfield is uh, ramping up um, and New um, Haven is uh, ramping up the most. Uh, and I think you can see the trends from there. Next slide, please. Next slide again is hospitalizations. And the top line, uh, you say, what happened, Governor? I thought you were saying we were flattening out. And what that I mean is we're not going up like a hockey step. It is going up on a linear basis. I think the bottom of that graph is probably a little more reflective for you. It shows you the actual net increase in people being hospitalized on a daily basis. And the fact that that is trending slightly lower gives us in our hospitals the breathing room that we need so desperately. Final chart is, I think you've seen this before, a number of hospitalizations by community. Obviously, Fairfield is still the dark blue and the most at risk. Uh, Wyndham, Tallinn, Litchfield County, places where we have more time to plan and more time to uh, focus on uh, the social distancing that will limit the infection rate limit the community infection, which I think, I hope, I pray, will make those communities much less afflicted a month from now than we've been in the southern part of the state. I'll just tell you a few other things that I'm thinking about. Uh, as we had our um, unified command meeting this morning with uh, all of the commissioners, 100 plus, uh, virtually online, uh, I, I think about the number of frontline responders and those that are at risk. And I think about um, the fact that we need to back them up, not just emotionally, not just with our support, but also uh, the fact that um, we may need some more people to help back them up. Firefighters, I was told that 99 of them are in self-quarantine right now. And remember, firefighters uh, do about um, 
90, no, about 80% of our EMS, um, emergency medical uh, responses. These are people we need. Think about how we back them up. You know, Miriam was saying over Demas about mental health counselors. And them, they get in contact, they have to self-quarantine. And these are um, people facing businesses. I can't do that by telecommuting. These are the type of people that we have to make sure we keep safe and find ways that we can support them along the way. We've had um, hundreds and hundreds of people going to 211.org, uh, the volunteer for which I'm so appreciative. And we're finding more and more people needs as we go out there. Food delivery, um, food delivery, for example, to um, homeless in our hotels now. We had to quarantine folks into uh, COVID and non-COVID homeless shelters. That means everybody's not getting fed at one place. Um, seniors, I mean, again, remember, everybody over the age of 60, 65, stay at home. Don't go out shopping. Don't go out to get food. Hopefully, uh, we'll find uh, folks who can volunteer, um, knock on your door, drop off a meal, do some shopping for you. And one of the things we're trying to do with our volunteer corps, our Connecticut Service Corps, is find more people that will be able to help support the, those efforts. Not to mention, um, you know, the thousands of people who are self-quarantining right now, who feel the symptoms, who uh, maybe or maybe not have COVID, they've got to stay at home. And again, these are the type of volunteers that we need. We're trying to find a way to at least get some minimum wage jobs out of this to get people a little bit back to work and make sure people who are at home can stay at home and stay at home safely. Um, I was talking um, to Deirdre today, Deirdre Gifford, the Department of Social Services, and she's coordinating the efforts with Uber and Lyft and our taxis, trying to augment our uh, drop-off uh, services, just to make sure people who have to stay at home can stay at home. We've talked a little bit to Massachusetts, and they're trying to put together a group of uh, 1,000 caseworkers. These caseworkers, and we're looking to do the same, would be there to attract and monitor folks who have an infection and be sure to there to uh, we know where they have go, who they've uh, touched base with, who they've connected with. So again, we can better track and better contain this virus um, uh, over the next few months. That's why I continue to emphasize the social distancing. As I mentioned before, we did a social distancing when it came to our um, stores and how strict we're going to be in terms of enforcing that, enforcing the occupancy of the stores, enforcing how close people can stand next to each other. And we are going out, we're taking a look at that, and we're going to be strict about it. We also are now putting out today, or yesterday, um, emergency order regarding a safe workplace. I told you how safe a workplace can be in terms of some of our frontline people working for state government. They've got to be people facing. That's the nature of their job. And I'm just thinking in terms of uh, the safe workplace, let's start with manufacturing. Start with our defense industry, where we have thousands and tens of thousands of people working, making uh, subs and uh, jet engines, as we talked about before. These are defense industries where we have to keep people there, not to mention the private manufacturing, many of them in the supply chain. That said, we're only going to do that in the safest way possible, and that's why we did our uh, safe workplaces order. And most of it is things everybody is already doing, but now it's going to be clear. This is enforceable, and if you don't do it, uh, we're going to tell you so. Uh, number one, you've got to self-monitor, you've got to self-test, you've got to have a fever test, and anybody who registers more than 100.4 degrees does not go to work. No questions asked. So you should know that as an employee, you should know that as a boss. That person is not going to work. And many of our manufacturing, they're doing the testing themselves, um, you know, at the front gate, at the front door. I was talking to Jim Laurie today, uh, Stanley Black & Decker. You know, they have, what, 30,000 people in manufacturing around the world, around the country, including Connecticut. They've had five infections so far. That tells you this self-policing can work, keeping the social distance making sure that the cafeterias are not a mob scene, but people separate, maybe have their meal in a car, making sure between shifts there's a timing to clean, making sure the two shifts do not uh, jam at the same time. These are the things that make enormous difference. These are the things that we will be enforcing. These are the things that allow our manufacturing to keep going on a safe basis. And if it's not done on a safe basis, we can't keep it going. I will tell you that, um, Thinking about what happens next, 
thinking about how we can get people slowly, methodically back to work in a safe uh, way. Uh, we've had good conversations uh, with my fellow governors, uh, Andrew Cuomo and Phil Murphy, New York and New Jersey. And we're thinking um, strong about the fact we have a tri-state workforce. You know, our people do go back and forth to some degree, not now with the stay-at-home um, order, but over time they, there was that type of transition. So we're thinking hard about what's going to be the nature of our testing protocol. How do we prioritize that? What are the, the COVID-related tests to see who's infected? What are the plasma or the um, uh, blood tests that allow us to see who is building up a vaccine, who is built, building up um, in immunity? And these are the folks that maybe we can get back to work uh, sooner. And this is what we're going to do together on a, a, a group basis. And we want to do this soon so we can start rolling out our testing protocol. Um, I was uh, recently uh, just on the phone with uh, Larry Merlo. He is a CEO at CVS and talking about the CVS testing protocol along with the 15-minute uh, Abbott lab test. And uh, he's got that going in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, and next up is Connecticut. More on that soon, but that will allow us to broaden the mix of tests in a dramatic way and allow us, A, to do the randomized testing that gives us a better idea of what's going on um, statewide. And then also with the um, plasma testing, the antibody testing, we'll be able to focus on those key groups that are getting back to work and make sure it's safe for them to get back to work. We're talking to um, you know epidemiologists and healthcare experts like um, Scott Gottlieb, a Connecticut resident, former head of the FDA, Zeke Emanuel, um, a thinker and the University of Pennsylvania, folks who are helping all of us to coordinate what's going to be our testing protocol now, as we have another month or two as we reach our surge, and then uh, what's going on afterwards. So over the next months, we know how to safely get people back to work. Flattening the curve works. Flattening the curve has had some initial success here in Connecticut, but flattening the curve only works if each and every one of you take the social distancing very seriously. You know, with that, let me uh, introduce Beth Bai. You know, Beth had the foresight. A lot of other states were shutting down daycare. We urged as many of our daycare to stay open as we could uh, just to make sure our first responders had a safe place for their um, uh, kids to go so that they could go take care of us at the nursing home, at the uh, hospital, and hopefully we can expand the group of first responders even more with daycare. With that, Beth? So they could go take care of us at the nursing home, at the uh, hospital, and hopefully we can expand the group of first responders even more. Beth, are you on mute? With that, Beth? Um, can folks hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Governor, uh, for your leadership and to the Lieutenant Governor and Josh Jabal. Um, when you listen, you can hear the daunting challenges uh, before us. I thought I'd start my comments by, like you, Governor, recognizing the people who are forward facing. Our child care workers have been work working each day to support our state during this COVID emergency. Uh, they understand what they mean to families and to their communities and our state is so grateful for their service. Um, we've been working hard at OEC to communicate with families, and I want to focus my comments today on child care. So we've been encouraging families as much as they can uh, to uh, have their children at home or with a trusted neighbor or friend, but we know that's not always possible. Um, so we're suggesting that families who still need help finding child care call 211 to find licensed child care and existing programs. And we do still have some capacity in Connecticut. Many programs recognize how important they are uh, to their families, as I said. Um, as the governor said, he has not, he did not direct child care programs to close. Many did close on their own or at the direction of local health. But this was such an important decision, I believe, because programs closed at a rate at which families could then find other options. Um, some states closed all at once, uh, leaving the workforce, especially the healthcare workforce, without the support they needed to get to work. Um, 
So we were able to keep a supply of existing spaces and that's been incredibly valuable. We've also added very specific capacity at hospitals with a project we call Project 26. Um, we now have childcare open at 29 hospitals, emergency spaces for workers who cannot find childcare and have to go to work. And uh, that's been supported by the Dalio Foundation and an incredible amount of work by my agency to open uh, that many sites in three weeks. The governor also has issued important executive orders uh, with strict public health requirements for programs that do remain open. Uh, some of the things you heard him talk about earlier, uh, children are screened on the way in for temperature. They need to stay in small groups and we've required small programs. So um, we know we need programs to remain open, but we're also cognizant of the public health challenges and we're working to reduce the risk of exposure. So as we're concerned about the surge and, and making sure we have staff for this public health response, we know that supply is critical and so is assessing demand. So at our at OEC, working in concert with 211 Childcare and some of our evaluation team at UConn, we are constantly monitoring demand and supply. Um, so we currently have a supply in Connecticut. There are still spaces and we're, we're constantly checking that. Um, we are also uh, instituting some programs to assure that we have supply. One is the program I talked about at hospitals, uh, where we have programs specifically there. Uh, we have 175 children enrolled in those programs, three more open next week, and we're working to be ready for a surge, much like you hear other parts of the response being ready for increase. We anticipate increase increases to happen in demand uh, so we're ready for that we also have family child care providers who stepped up and have offered um, some spaces to be ready uh, for that surge the other thing we're doing is uh, starting this week we're instituting connecticut cares for child care those are specific funds from the federal bill uh, that are sending uh, extra funds to programs that have remained open. That is private programs, public programs. Um, the, there are bonuses or funding from $850 a month to $1,200 a month to help support some of the extra costs of being open during the pandemic and assure they have funds for supplies, which they're having a hard time getting, and to compensate staff who are really stepping up at this time. Um, there's information about this Connecticut Cares for Child Care program on our website, um, the Office of Early Childhood. We're also really concerned about our early childhood businesses. Um, many of them have had to close. Uh, the ones that are open are operating uh, with low enrollments on average. And uh, we want to make sure we have a supply of child care when this is all over. And uh, they're some of the most fragile businesses in our state. So uh, Connecticut is really recognizing this and we're working to bring as much information as we can to providers uh, with DECD, SBA and the Department of Labor. Um, we recognize how important it is that these businesses can reopen because they're part of our economic recovery. It's part of the workforce infrastructure. So with that, I would just close by saying this is a pandemic. It's somewhat unpredictable. Things keep changing. And just know that our team at OEC will keep stepping up and flexing and continuing our efforts to address this public health emergency, to support our frontline workers, our public health workers, first responders for child care and the child care community. Um, we, we also do all we can to support them. Um, so again, thank you, Governor, for your leadership. And I'm happy to answer questions uh, at the appropriate time. Thanks, Beth. And now we will uh, start taking questions from members of the press. Uh, we will start with uh, Patrick Scahill from Connecticut Public Radio. Uh, this question is for the governor. I was um, hoping for an update on the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, looking to see how many loans have been approved for uh, small businesses here in Connecticut. I can tell you that there have been uh, about $40 billion of loans approved uh, in that first day. And uh, I know that Connecticut got um, 
uh, our, our share of those loans. I can't tell you exactly what they are. I can tell you they are continuing to process these loans right now. Uh, there were some um, speed bumps, I guess, with some of the bigger national banks as they tried to figure out what the protocol and rules were coming down in terms of how this was going to be implemented. And I think that they've got that resolved now. So if you haven't gotten your loan in, it's not too lo uh, late to get your loan in. And this will cover two months of your full operating expenses if you keep everybody employed. And do we have any sense as to applications received or how those applications are, are being processed in terms of delays? You know that? As of, um, as of yesterday, we're up to $650 million in loan applications in Connecticut. Um, and... That's despite the fact that several banks um, have not yet come online. There's been a bit of a slow start with a couple of banks in terms of accepting and processing loan applications. Um, but you know, by our estimates from our DECD Commissioner David Lehman, we're kind of tracking ahead of the nation in terms of the percentage of loans uh, that seem to be coming into Connecticut relative to the size of our small business space. Uh, next question will come from Chris Keating of the Hartford Current. Please unmute your phone and ask your question. Uh, yes, Governor. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the 71 deaths that were mentioned? Uh, was that in a 24-hour period, or is uh, does that include other times and uh, uh, catching up numbers, for lack of a better term? You want to speak to that, Josh? Hey, Chris. It's it's Josh Jabal. Um, that that's what was reported in over the last 24 hours. Occasionally, there can be a lag, as we, you know, some of the data is reported manually, but uh, the vast majority of that, as we understand, is in the last 24 hours. Uh, Governor, one other point, if I could. Um, and as you know, New York and Boston and San Francisco uh, have been banning non-essential construction. Um, are you considering any changes in Connecticut regarding construction? Well, as you know, we're keeping our big outdoor public construction projects going, roads, bridges, schools, where it's easier to keep social distancing. We're getting more surgical masks, um, three-ply masks, making those available. We're going to get access to them if uh, you're a construction team that's having a hard time getting access to that. I do worry a little bit about the indoor construction if you're in tight uh, situation. And uh, right now, um, we're doing that on a case-by-case -case basis. But if you can't keep that um, six feet of social distancing, uh, you, sh you shouldn't be doing that construction. And I just add as well that in the safe workplaces guidance, guidance that's coming out tonight that the governor mentioned, there will be some additional guidelines specifically with regards to ensuring that even indoor uh, construction sites can be kept safe. Uh, next question will come from a WTIC. Please unmute. Hi, Governor. Uh, Bristol Health came out saying today, due to the decreasing supply and limited availability of testing kits, they're only doing 40 tests a day because they simply just don't have enough tests. Is Connecticut getting more tests? And if so, when? I can tell you our testing has been generally ramping up over the last uh, week or so. I can tell you we have a number, a couple of new companies will be greatly increasing our capacity there. If Bristol Health is having a, a problem with reagents and the such, uh, there's been stop and starts on a couple of the local hospitals. We're trying to keep that flow going. Uh, WTIC News Radio. All right, we will come back to you, close the program, and restart. Next will be uh, Julia Bergman from the day. Hi, Governor. Uh, my question is also surrounding sort of the testing. Um, uh, my colleagues and I are noticing and are reporting that there are some discrepancies as far as access to testing. Um, can you talk a little bit about how people, how it's determined who gets tested? And do you have a total number of test kits the state currently has in its possession? I'll start with that and then hand it over. Look, our, our priorities are very clear. Number one, in terms of folks who are admitted into the hospital, so we can do some preliminary triage. Who has COVID? Who has to go to the ICU? Who can we uh, you know, send to intermediate care or another facility? By doing that, we're opening up dozens of beds, dozens of beds, because we get people uh, properly allocated. You know, number two, we're looking at um, first responders, in particular, in this case, the healthcare workers, those that are taking care of the sick, make sure they're tested and make sure that they're safe and not infecting uh, anybody else. 
And uh, finally, uh, we are broadly testing anybody who has that special um, permission from a doctor that absolutely needs it. Once we get going with the CVS testing protocol, that will be broader. There's a CVS.com site. You'll be able to go to there and see what um, that you'll remotely put in all your um, uh, different test cases, and they'll determine electronically, give you a tag whether you can get that test or not. That's probably a, a week or two away. Uh, we'll go next to uh, News 12, John Craven. Hi, Governor. Um, so I have two questions that are related about nursing homes, so I'll ask them at the same time. Uh, we have a major cluster of coronavirus cases at Golden Hill Rehab in Milford. So first question is, as of today, how many positive cases do we have at that facility? And second, DPH is telling us this case is under investigation. What exactly does under investigation mean? I'm going to start and hand that over to Josh. But um, first of all, John, it's really great to hear your voice and you sound strong. And that's uh, that's good news for everybody. We're cheering you on. I can tell you that we've got about 38 percent of our nursing homes across the state now do have uh, an infection, in many cases more than one infection. As you heard over the last few days, we're being very swift about having COVID-only wings and COVID-only facilities. We'll be announcing the first three COVID-only nursing facilities uh, in the next day or so. And that's what we're doing uh, in a very strict way to mitigate the spread of this in a very contained um, environment with the most vulnerable population. Josh, do you know about this particular facility? Yeah, hi, John. It's Josh. Um, so with that particular facility in Milford, I think what the reference is to is that our Department of Public Health um, professionals have been in daily contact with the operators um, at that facility um, via FaceTime. They've been on site recently. Um, and ensuring that they have, uh, you know, the adequate infection control procedures being implemented, adequate staff. And so we're very aware of that situation and our Department of Public Health is providing a lot of direct assistance. So, but Josh, what, what does under investigation mean? I mean, is, is there some sort of, you know, are you guys investigating possible violations or sanctions here? No, I, th I think it's more a reference to the assistance that's being provided right now to help ensure that that facility is, is stable and doing all the right things to take care of its residents. Let's try to go back to uh, News Radio WTIC. We'll move along next to Matthew Campbell, WFSB Eyewitness News. Uh, yes, Governor, we're looking to see if there's any uh, information about recoveries. We know that tracking the hospitalizations and the deaths, that's important to paint a picture of where we stand, but I think recoveries could also help clear that up and also give residents hope. So do we have any firm numbers on how many recoveries there are? Um, I can tell you, looking at the New York folks who have been discharged, I think it's uh, well over 75%. Um, we're going to get those numbers in more detail for you here in Connecticut uh, starting tomorrow. But I think people should understand a few things. Uh, the overwhelming majority of people who contract COVID go home, 14 days and they're back on the game. And that's uh, overwhelmingly like 99% for people under the age of 50. Um, obviously there's a little more risk, a lot more risk for people over the age of 70. Still, the chances of recovery are strong as long as you follow the protocol. Folks over 70 are more likely to be hospitalized. Uh, ventilators obviously are one way that we're able to keep people alive. And so far we have enough ventilators that nobody is being denied. I'll move along next to NBC Connecticut, Matt Austin. Hi, Governor. I was wondering if you can explain a little bit more about these workplace rules, how you're going to be monitoring companies, what the possible penalties might be, and what employees can do if they have any concerns. Who can they go to? Well, the um, for the larger uh, facilities, be they manufacturing or construction, um, we're able to do a drive through, we're able to see, we're able to self monitor. And frankly, uh, if employees feel like they're at some risk, uh, they've been um, able to reach out and contact uh, us or contact the Department of Labor. And when it comes to the uh, smaller facilities, we're less likely to get there on a regular basis. There's a lot of self policing going on right now, and we do get occasional uh, complaints, and we do respond to them. Uh, right now, um, first time out, you're probably going to get a, a strong. Um, 
a strong morning. We understand that not everybody can get a hold of the three-ply um, surgical masks at this point. We're doing everything we can to get those for you, urging employees that maybe their uh, boss doesn't have that as yet. Wear a scarf or a bandana if you, if you feel more comfortable. That's certainly the recommendation of CDC. But we find it's an environment that's unsafe. We will close it down. Move along next to uh, News 8, Bob Wilson. Governor, you said you didn't want to start singing happy days are here again. You've been planning ahead for the surge for many weeks. Are you planning equally ahead for the return back, the back side of the curve? What would it look like? Do you have any thoughts of who might go back to work first, how you might reopen businesses? And uh, then I had a follow-up question for Beth Bye. Yeah, Bob, we, we know about the surge. We know about the peak. We know how important it was to make, mitigate the effects of that peak in terms of protecting capacity of our hospitals so we can protect you. And maybe, maybe, maybe we're getting closer to that point. In the meantime, what, as you say, what's it going to be on the downside? I do worry when I said that uh, comment about happy days, is everybody's going to think we flick the switch, we're out of this, and everybody pours back to work. I think that would be a very dangerous thing. And all the experts I'm talking to have said, be thoughtful about how people get back to work. Start with the least vulnerable populations. Test those least vulnerable populations. Test everybody who's in a critical industry so that they um, either have the uh, blood test or have the COVID test so we know that with, if, if they have the necessary immunization. We don't have a vaccine yet, Bob. That would probably get us out of the woods faster. Until then, we have to self-vaccine, and we do that by testing. I, this maybe will take many months, but we're going to do this on a thoughtful way that gets Connecticut back to work. And for Commissioner By, how are you monitoring the daycares? I know they're going to be critical in getting Connecticut back to work, and it's a difficult situation all around. How are you monitoring for COVID cases, and have you had any COVID cases in, in the uh, daycare? I think we need you to unmute, Commissioner Unmute. Bye. I'm sorry, rookie mistake. Um, what we're doing is um, all the children are screened on their way in for temperature. Uh, so to make sure the children are not sick. Um, most of these programs are fairly new to be open. Um, we did have one case of a child testing positive, but they tested positive before they started and did not expose anyone in the program uh, to the to the virus. Uh, so we, we work with public health, just like any other setting, um, that we would go to public health and they would do the tracing if there are cases. We're doing our best. The child care workers are doing a lot of cleaning and hand washing and washing of toys. Um, but we know, you know, nothing is perfect. There's no perfect answer here. Um, but what we can do is create small sites to follow really careful public health guidance uh, that Department of Public Health has worked with us with, and um, thanks to the funding from the Dalio Foundation and some of the federal dollars, we can provide funds to programs that are open so that they can afford to follow these enhanced public health guidelines. We'll move along next to Connecticut Mirror, Mark Pazniokas. Uh, Governor, slightly off topic subject, uh, the presidential primary have you made a decision as to, uh, number one, whether or not you need to issue an executive order uh, for this to go forward in a safe manner? And second, do you support the decision of the Secretary of State to send out absentee ballot applications to uh, every voter? Yeah, we are um, actively discussing this with the legislative leadership. Denise Merrill gave us her plan. Um, you know, Bob Clark and Paul Mounds are going over that plan right now. But I'll tell you, uh, we had to put off the, um, the primary date to June 2nd, along with our neighbors. Uh, I'm not inclined to cancel any type of a vote, and I do have a stay-at-home rule. So I'm going to have to find a way that people can vote, and especially seniors, so they don't have to leave their houses and go vote. So obviously, the uh, voting by mail makes a lot of sense to me. Now I need the lawyers to figure out how to draft that, Paz. Well, have you had a discussion as to how you can get around the constitutional um, prohibition that seems to be in place on voting by mail, as opposed to perhaps uh, taking a lenient approach to what people can do with absentee ballots? 
Uh, let me get back to you on that. But right now, uh, in a pandemic, a real fear for people's health, there is a sickness uh, provision in there. So our lawyers are working through that right now with the legislative leadership. Thank you, Governor. Ken Dixon, Hearst, Connecticut Media. Hey, Governor. Hey, Ken. Uh, I've never felt more socially distant from you than right now. I miss you. Um, <laughs> um, can you or Josh give us the update on ventilators, how many we have, how many are coming, how many we need, please? Over to you, Josh. Sure, I can. Um, so our hospitals have been um, working diligently. We've increased the total number of ventilators that we now have in the, the fleet across the state to um, about 1,400. Um, so good progress has been made over the last several days. Um, both uh, uh, bringing uh, models in from out of state, um, looking at other models that they have that can be adapted um, for use for COVID patients. Um, and uh, the governor's been making calls to the executives, senior executives of um, some of the manufacturers as well to try to escalate and prioritize additional deliveries. Um, you know, ultimately the number that we need will be dependent on the degree to which we can flatten the curve, right? And so we put out a plan last Friday or a, a, a forecast last Friday that is kind of under, you know, a, a scenario where we wanted to plan for, for worse, you know, some of the more extreme cases as the governor directed us to be prepared. Um, our hope is that we don't need that many, but again, we continue to scour the globe to look for more ventilators, knowing that that's most likely to be the, the primary constraint that we'd have um, as we look to scale up our hospital capacity. I will say on the What's subject the of, Ken, on the subject of scouring yeah. the globe, um, I put a real priority on, we have a couple of ventilator manufacturers right here in the state of Connecticut. I feel a lot more confident about uh, their ventilators and what were being sourced over there in China. And I think we'll have some good news on that in the next uh, week or two. Um, thanks, Governor. Also, um, Mayor Ganim in Bridgeport is declaring what he's calling a voluntary curfew at 8 p.m. Um, every night. You think that's a good idea? Have, have you talked to him about it? Um, has anybody uh, mention anything to you like in the retail world about it? Look, I, I think uh, that's probably a decision best made by the local municipality. Every town is a little bit different there. So I respect Mayor Ganim's thought that an 8, B, 8 p.m. curfew makes sense for Bridgeport. What makes sense for Bridgeport may not make sense for Pomfret. So we'll leave that up to local discretion for now. Thanks, Governor. We'll go next to Paul Hughes, Republican American. Uh, hi, Governor. Hey, Paul. How are you doing today? Hanging in there, man. Thank good. Um, you've talked a lot about the hospital surge, but uh, the death toll has already uh, exceeded the worst flu season uh, that was on record uh, since uh, 2009. So I'm just wondering what are what steps are being taken to handle what could be um, an increase in the number of um, uh, bodies from uh, COVID-19 uh, patients. What I can tell you about um, the death rate is uh, it probably lags other indicators, certainly lags the infection um, indicator by uh, a couple of weeks, two to three weeks. So while maybe in the death rate, you're still not seeing the deceleration we'd like to see, uh, what um, th that shows where we were maybe uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think the hospitalization is a more current number. And by the way, we do have capacity there. So everybody needs the ventilators. Everybody needs the ICU is getting that. So I think you're going to see um, an improving number on that metric as well. Yes, but in terms of uh, just morgue space and, and even body bags, uh, you know, are, are there going to be enough? And what if not? what's being done to provide those resources? Paul, our, our, we've been in discussion with our hospitals. Our hospitals are making preparations on that topic. And what sort of preparations are those? Um, you know, I think it's been widely reported what's been going on in New York, some of the measures that they've been taking to prepare for some severe scenarios. So uh, our hospitals are, are watching that, that approach carefully. So we're talking about refrigerated, uh, trailers? Correct. Okay. 
Thank you. And finally, uh, Sue Haig with the Associated Press. Save the best for last. <laughs> Hi, Governor. How are you? Hey, Sue. Hi. I was on a call today uh, that, gov that um, Senator Blumenthal had with healthcare workers, and it just seems like there's this common refrain that there are not enough um, N95 masks. It doesn't matter if you're a visiting nurse or even state employees that are working in places like Natchog. It just seems like there's still a lack of equipment out there for healthcare providers, and they're really afraid. What can be done? Uh, we're at the front of the line for the equipment that's going to allow us to sanitize uh, PPE on a regular basis. I can't tell you whether that's next week or the week thereafter. I can tell you we've sourced the very best N95 masks. Some of them are coming in on a, a daily basis now, but it's coming in in a trickle. And uh, obviously there's a worldwide shortage there. Uh, so what I'm doing is telling um, healthcare workers, uh, we're working our heart out to get this done. We are going everywhere we can. We're going right to the top, going to the senior manufacturers, making sure that we're going to get um, our share of this. And I'm telling everybody, Three weeks is too late. Next week is too late. We need it now. We'll take a less now rather than a lot more a lot later. And uh, people got to know, I know how serious this is. I know the risk people are taking. And uh, we're doing everything we can to keep you safe. And I say that to the people of Connecticut. And we have actually one last journalist, a CT News Junkie. Go ahead. Hey, Governor. Hey, Christine. Um, so I'm wondering, in your conversations with the White House and the other governors, have you been clear about how unfair it is that you have to rely on acquisition of PPE and, and you know, scouring the globe for this without the help of the federal government? I'd say um, me and 49 other governors have been quite clear on that uh, subject on a bipartisan basis. And uh, now we governors are taking this into our own hands. We have a regional consortium. We're purchasing uh, from, uh, you know, the six state region. We're going out there trying to buy. But it's a crazy process. And if the federal government stood up on this months ago, even weeks ago, we'd be in a very different position than we are now. But um, anyway, um, the feds have made their determination they're going to leave this up to the states. They do have a stockpile. And occasionally they're allocating that a little bit. And I've reminded people that Connecticut, I said this 100 times, I'll say it 101, is part of the regional pandemic, part of a hot, uh, hot zone. And we have to get that spare equipment as well. But that said, let me just tell you, our hospitals are doing an amazing job. And we're beginning to share equipment and share events and share people between and among hospitals to make sure that we have capacity. And right now we have the capacity. Connecticut is doing it on their own. But believe me, I'm knocking on White House's door every day I can. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Governor.